Yeah, I have a few slides, but I'm going to start off uh, a little bit uh, differently because uh, this is a presentation on how to get published. So I'll start off with people uh, if you have questions at the beginning. And uh, then uh, I'll answer the questions as best I can. So can we start off with a few questions? I'm sure some of you have come with some problems you've had with publishing or lack thereof. Yes, at the back. Thanks, Rory. Uh, Bonnie Stewart from Windsor in Canada. Uh, I'm going to try to adapt my question initially for, for Judith um, and, and frame something for you. Uh, I recognize that in the European context, higher ed uh, is fully kind of government funded, but as you know, in, in Canada and the US and other spots, it isn't necessarily. Um, and so what I'm seeing with publishing, particularly for those of us who are early career researchers, is there are some great journals that are fully open, but a lot of publishing spaces are becoming more and more enclosed and have very expensive open access fees for digital journals, even though the writing is you know, contributed by academics, the reviewing is done for free by academics, um, and if you have a $2,000 grant total, you can't pay for a $3,500 open access publishing fee, and it's not paid by your university. And I feel like this is a, a real challenge for at least large swaths of the open education community. I know it's not the kind of work you represent, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we can work together to actually open open access. Well, I can uh, say that I, I don't think that we should be um, co collaborating with those that have these very high uh, publishing fees. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, it's a big mistake in Europe for governments to be paying huge amounts of money to the monopoly capitalist uh, uh, companies that are now really trying to take full control over all of academic publishing. So I would recommend strongly don't do it. And if you must get published in that uh, particular uh, um, high value or highly rated uh, journal is don't pay any open access publishing fees at all and just uh, but put your uh, put your article out anyway as a pre-publishing in on your uh, on your site or on a repository spread it around put it on other places and uh, um, uh, you can do it as long as it's a pre-published uh, article you can do it legally and it'll get your article out there in any, in any case. But I don't think that we should be cooperating with them at all. I think it's a huge, uh, I mean, this is what you call uh, um, open washing, that you're paying the big publishers in order for them to be open access. Uh, Robert, uh, Robert Schuur from the Netherlands. I totally agree and I will want to add to the, uh, to the previous uh, question. Uh, it, recently, just recently, there has been an initiative uh, to promote the Diamond Access Open Journals in Europe. It's a Europe I, can, I, I don't have the, the, the details uh, uh, directly at hand. I can look it up and make it uh, available. Uh, uh, you can, it, it, there's a kind of... Uh, 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 what's it called? Uh, you can undersign it. That you, uh, but they are also uh, uh, now doing all kinds of initiatives to promote this uh, this uh, one. I, the second is that um, you mentioned the publishing. The publish or perish uh, is actually the main cause uh, of all this uh, publishing, uh, which which is which is done, uh, and which rely, which you should do in those uh, uh, not open access uh, uh, journals, uh, otherwise your career is harmed. And there is, uh, now I can uh, uh, say the situation in the Netherlands, there is now a recognition and reward initiatives around all universities to make, uh, um, uh, to, to get the pressure of this 
only publishing uh, takes you uh, any further in your career. And I think that would really uh, deserve some attention to, uh, to get away from this publish uh, or perish uh, uh, way of working. But because that's the real cause. And the third thing I want to, to, to uh, uh, add is the, 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 what they call the predatory journals. There is not so many uh, known about these kinds of journals. Now you, you know each, each one get this uh, advertised, published in, in, in our journal. Uh, throughput time of one month, well, how good could, you, could be the review if you publish it or you uh, send it in at 1st of April and it's published at 1st of May. And when you look at all those articles in those kinds of journals, it's always this one month that can't be any good. That could be a sign, but people don't know this. Yeah. The, uh, just, just to clarify uh, what Robert's talking about is uh, with Diamond uh, Open Access, you do not pay any uh, article publishing uh, costs and uh, the big one was of course they were pushing what was gold open access where you pay for in gold <laughs> you pay for the uh, article processing costs so that's uh, uh, it's a big uh, actually diamond has only just become up as a, as a label and uh, I can assure you that our uh, Journal is a diamond golden access, a diamond uh, uh, open access journal. We we do not charge publishing fees. Um, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so, oh. No. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, so following up on um, what Bonnie had mentioned, and also open washing, um, and I, I would be. I'd be really curious to hear from you what your recommendation would be um, to some of these, um, you know, younger researchers who are looking to publish. When you're looking at, um, you know, wanting to de-invest in some of these, you know, I would say conglomerates at this point, like, that are, you know, double dipping basically like Elsevier um, and having people pay to publish and then charging people back to access it. The tenure promotion process at many institutions, at least in the, in the US, really um, mandate for faculty to publish in specific titles. Um, they're mandated by their departments, by their institutions. Um, they are looking at um, you know, job security and advancing their careers based on titles and um, their impact factor and whatnot. And so for those who are balancing out against um, you know, maintaining their university position and deinvestment. What would you suggest? Well, again, I'd, I'd say the same thing: is uh, don't pay the uh, um, the APC uh, to make it open. You, some of them, what fifteen thousand dollars? I've heard. I've seen seven thousand five hundred dollars. Don't pay it. Get it published under the under the strict regulations they have and put your article up as a pre-pub so as people do have access to it. But we're also finding, and uh, I, I understood in the US was moving that way too, but I know Canada and a lot of places are, is that uh, if, if you're government funded, uh, it has to be open access. And this is very new. And actually our journal, I believe it was the first open access journal in, in Canada, I haven't heard of any other, but we had a big fight with our government uh, funding agencies uh, uh, at the beginning in, two, in uh, the year 2000 till 2004. And uh, we fought very, very heavily. We lobbied, we protested, did all kinds of things in order to get accepted. And we were finally accepted in 2004 as the first open access journal to be to receive a grant from the uh, federal government. And uh, believe it or not, in 2017, they changed their whole method and they say now everything must be open access. So we've come a long way uh, uh, since then. There was another question over here. Yeah. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Hi. Um, devil in the room, so I work for Frontiers. Um, However, I do manage a Diamond Open Access Journal like yourself. Um, my question actually has actually just been partially answered by you in terms of model. Um, are you, would you think that in terms of scaling up Diamond Open Access long term, is it essentially a case of direct governmental funding 
rather than researchers providing the uh, the resources because of course sustainability has to be considered here uh, and I'm curious to know what your thoughts would be in terms of long-term issue and scalability there would it essentially be direct funding like you just described for your journal well um, our our journal is uh, is financed by the university we one one position a manager not my position as editor I'm okay. I'm faculty member and we get a uh, thirty thousand dollar a year grant from uh, the uh, social sciences and humanities research council of, of Canada and so that's where we get our funding mm -hmm. now the whole problem of funding and sustainability to me is very simple but it's very difficult to get there and it, the simple thing is that let's take one tenth of the money that we're giving to the monopoly publishers and use that money to support open access and then use the nine tenths that we save and put it into educating students, lower tuition or whatever and helping students. But a lot of people don't understand this, but uh, uh, the monopoly public educational publishing industry is the most profitable industry in the world. 30, last year Elsevier, 36% Google, Google net uh, profit, yes, 26% uh, uh, for Google and Microsoft about 15%. Like it is, they are making a fortune off of us because we give them everything for free and we give them our labor for free and then they sell it back to us. This is, a, to me, this, this is unsustainable. People talk about the sustainability of uh, academic publishing this is unsustainable and so we have to uh, uh, work at it and it's a very simple response is let's take some of that money and start supporting open access journals and I believe there was a movement in the United States uh, li among librarians to uh, to start that process I, I hope it continues thank you thanks um, Prof McGill I think that we might be running a bit short on so, if we could do your presentation and then well, have some questions. Well, yeah, I'd, ra I'd rather ask, answer people's questions and what they're concerned about. Okay. Uh, but I'll go in and I'm sure some of uh, the concerns of people uh, are in the slides as well. <clears throat> so, uh, I've already mentioned about uh, uh, Erodal being a, uh, a diamond open access and about the fight that we had with Shirk. And... Uh, uh, we are Scopus, and so yes, we are in the list of journals that uh, um, that are accepted by universities around the world. You generally have to get into uh, 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 Scopus uh, as uh, in order for them to recognize it. In many countries, they are pushing very heavily. They say, I've heard it so many times in developing countries, you must publish three articles a year in Scopus journals and to me I don't know anyone in our field who publishes three articles a year in Scopus journals it's just absurd but they are under pressure to do that and so we're getting a huge number of articles uh, uh, being submitted that are just not of the uh, uh, not of a good quality and we now have only a 10 percent uh, uh, acceptance rate for, we get about a, well over a thousand a year and uh, we publish only four, 40 articles a year. So there's some of the statistics you can see there. <clears throat> and here's a, a, a good diagram from uh, Wikipedia on what Diamond Open Access is. So you can see that it's, uh, it's free for all authors, it's free for the readers, it's peer reviewed and uh, uh, the authors retain copyright and others like the gold open access as you can see is not uh, um, uh, it, it's not uh, free if you have to pay an article processing charge and it could be it could be gold and not pay an article processing charge uh, but we're calling that diamond in any case <clears throat> um, some other journals besides Erodal if you're 
topic is op open educational resources or open practice um, an International Council for Distance Education uh, journal, uh, the International Journal of Open Educational Resources, and uh, a new journal that's just coming out, the Journal of Open Educational Resources in Higher Education. Um, or you can look up the directory of uh, open access journals and uh, uh, in there, uh, 24 of 26 journals on open and distance education topics have no publication fees. So there's a wide variety there. Uh, unfortunately, um, many of them are not scopus. And uh, um, when it comes to uh, uh, tenure and promotion, uh, some faculties look on that uh, very seriously. Um, the articles published under Open Select uh, with Taylor and Francis um, get 95% more citations. So when they're open, you do get more citations and a lot more uh, uh, tenure and promotion committees are looking very strongly at the citations for your articles. And uh, uh, you get seven times as many downloads in open select in, in that one. So uh, standard article publishing charges are around uh, nearly $3,000. So uh, again, uh, we should avoid using them altogether. Um, I'd like to point out if your studies are about open education resources, uh, we have uh, together a repository um, uh, of articles and reports focusing on open education, on all different aspects of open education. And uh, there's uh, now nearly 3,000 records uh, by uh, thousands of authors. And uh, um, it's a very good place to start uh, if you're doing research on any topic related to open education. Now I'm going to get into some of the uh, ditty gritty of writing a scholarly article. And uh, this is not for the uh, excellent writers. Um, if you're an excellent writer, you can break all the rules and still get published. Um, I'm not an excellent writer. I have been published, but I've done it by following some of these rules. Um, and uh, uh, about rejections, I've been rejected as an author many times more times than I wish to remember. I didn't cry all the time, but I did cry sometimes when I was rejected. And I'm an editor, and I reject people all the time, and it hurts, it, it, it does hurt me. But uh, uh, Victoria Ray gave a, a very good, uh, simple and succinct uh, uh, view of writing a scholarly article, and uh, I've adapted it because I, don't fully agree with her. Of course, I don't fully agree with anybody, so <laughs> that's one of my problems, my wife tells me. Um, but uh, there's a basic structure, an introduction, a literature review, a theoretical framework, a case study, if it is a case study, uh, if not, maybe an example. They've got the data, the methodology, the results, discussion, and conclusion. Now, before submitting, this is something that bothers anybody who's a, um, an editor of a journal, is uh, read several articles in the journal. Get an idea of what, what is being accepted. I mean, really, you can tell somebody submits an article that they've never looked at anything in there. And then check the style of the journal is it APA or Modern Language, Chicago, whatever the style is, and uh, submit it in that style. And it saves you time because uh, our manager just looks at it. It's not an AP. We do APA, and we send it back to you. And then some will send it back in another style. No, it has to be an APA style. And 
And uh, we got one complaint from a guy who said, well, if I send it to you in that, I have to change it to that style, and then I have to go to another uh, journal, I have to change it to that style. And so they want us to do all the changing, all the work of changing the style, rather than doing it themselves. Uh, but there are solutions to that, uh, and uh, I'll come to that in a minute. Read the submission requirements. We have requ other requirements, not just APA style. Read them. Hey, you know, that'll get you somewhere. Um, check the word limit. And uh, uh, if there's a word limit, uh, try to stick to it. And, oh, you never, never submit two journals at the same time. This is a real no-no. And in our field, I know editors of different journals around, and we know who is doing that, and you get blacklisted. There are blacklists. We do not accept people who uh, send it to two journals at the same time. So uh, don't do that, please. Now, for those who, like the gentleman who complained to me about uh, having to change the, uh, the style, um, we recommended to him to use a reference manager. And as you can see here, there are all kinds of reference managers out there. And uh, you can change the style. I can change the style from APA to IEEE like this, like this. And then you have to clean it up a little bit, but the basic style is changed. And uh, uh, so you can do that with a wide variety of different, uh, uh, different re reference management tools. And for those uh, who are sticking to uh, open source, and I recommend it, is uh, there are a lot of open source reference managers. They're, they're, they're not all high cost, and uh, they're very good. And so if you're doing uh, graduate work or research of any kind, and you're not using a reference manager, grow up. <laughs> I mean, it makes life so much easier for you and for the people you deal with. What do reference managers do? Well, number one for, in, in our uh, uh, situation, number one for you is you format the paper in different styles so as you can easily resubmit to different journals because you are going to get rejected at some point and you are going to think, gee, maybe I can get it into another journal. Rewrite it based on the criticism you get and send it to another journal. It may be, a, if it's the same style, that's wonderful. If it isn't, get your reference manager and press the button. Um, you can also insert, annotate, and organize your citations very simply. Um, you can create bibliogra uh, bibliographies. And also, they, they warn you of unintentional plagiarism if you're uh, using too much of somebody else's work. Um, uh, you can share references with people. People ask me sometimes, do you have a, uh, 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 any references? People, I say, mainly my students. Of course, they are people. But uh, um, they ask uh, for re sharing references, so I give them... Uh, I, I go to my uh, reference manager and I go through, click, yeah, that's available. I just copy, paste them, send them off. It's, uh, it's very easy to do. And, of course, there's a grammar aid and, uh, uh, of great importance, not just to English second language learners, but to English, English people, too. Some of our worst articles are written by native English speakers. So it's not just about people with English as a second language. <clears throat> How did I do there? <clears throat> so, you come to your paper, finally, you start off with an introduction. Something really simple 
and it's surprising how many do not do this, is state the problem. If you have previous work on it, come out and say it right at the beginning. And then how are you going to address the problem? And then what are the implications for the field of study of open education? Um, very uh, uh, simple things to do at the beginning. The literature view. The first thing, you've got to show that you've read the relevant literature. And uh, on both sides, if you're a proponent of one opinion, don't just show uh, that you've read all the people who share your opinion. You must show what other opinions on it are that may be contradictory to yours and maybe put in, it'd be nice to put in an explanation of why you don't agree with them. And I've seen this a lot with the learning styles. There's a big debate on learning styles. And those who are supporting learning styles, they'll send a long paper with 20 citations supporting learning styles. And uh, they don't mention any of the 20 or 100 citations that are against learning styles. You can go either way. I'm... I think there's something to learning style, but I don't think there's a lot to it. I think there's something to it that's worth it. But um, again, uh, you have to show both sides of the uh, situation. Um, if there are foundational texts, um, you should have them in there uh, on the subject that you're writing about. Uh, but you also must have the most recent and relevant papers. One of the biggest uh, reasons for rejecting papers is that they say that the, the, the references are too old. And that usually tells us that this is about the fourth time round coming to our journal because then they haven't updated the references to the recent years. Uh, explain how papers are relevant in, uh, in your submission. So some just go through a long list but they don't explain why they're relevant to the research they're doing in this particular paper. And uh, identify gaps in the literature and say that, that no one has really written about this, or I wouldn't use the word no one, say very few people, or it has not been, you wanna hedge a little bit sometimes when you're making those statements. A theoretical framework. Another reason for rejection when people don't put their paper into a uh, theoretical framework. Demonstrate that you understand relevant theories. Show how the relevant the theories are in your paper. Explain your theoretical assumptions. And especially if you don't agree with the, uh, uh, some of the relevant theories, just explain why. And a lot of us don't agree with relevant theories. Which key variables are the important ones? Another way of, uh, help, of, of helping to clarify your paper is give an example. Um, it's a useful background to your paper. It can, to illustrate a principle or thesis, give an, give an example of, uh, uh, of what you're talking about. Uh, these examples can clarify points uh, to be made. I mean, your whole paper could be a case study, and then that's an example. But if it isn't, it, just a short one paragraph or two paragraph example helps to clarify things. Data and the methods. Explain what information you're using. Statistics, documents, interviews, wh what are you doing? Where is the information coming from? And how did you analyze uh, the information? And uh, really important in putting out the results. This is the, this is the meat of the paper. The data must be based on the research conducted in your paper. And people come up with all kinds of things. One of the worst things we're getting, and I'm getting a lot of them, and I blame it on an overemphasis 
on learner-centeredness is we're getting all kinds of papers where they say, oh, our students, we did a survey and they all agree that they collaborated. They were all satisfied. Uh, they, they say that their self-efficacy uh, improved. And they don't put anything in there, even about what subject was being taught or whether the students learned anything or not. And we point them to our advice to the authors where we say this is a journal about learning. We don't care if the students are satisfied. We don't care if they're self-efficacious. We don't care if they collaborate unless it leads to learning. So you have to put in there that they've learned something and that you have some data in your paper that some learning occurred while you were doing all this. I'm not against students being satisfied. This is wonderful. But if they're satisfied and they didn't learn anything, uh, yeah, I have a problem with that. I'm an educator. My job is to make sure that when they come into my class for the first time, by the time they leave, something has gone in between the ears. Something, they know something that they didn't know before. They have a skill that they didn't know before. And if they're satisfied, wonderful. If they collaborated to do it, this is really great. And if it made them more self-efficacious, uh, or whatever other opinion they have in your survey, these are wonderful things. But they're only wonderful in our paper, in our uh, journal, as if they learned something. Um, uh, some of them, maybe they should send it to a psychology paper where all the students were happy. That's important for psychology, maybe educational psychology, but not in a learning journal. So the data must speak to the problem that you posed. Um, and you need to organize results analytically and not chronologically. So you have to put your analysis together in that way. In the conclusion and discussion, uh, you need to reflect on the broader implications of your results, uh, summarize the findings, note the limitations of your study, and future research suggestions. And I'll tell you, if you took these things and just put them in, in a line and then filled in what it is for your paper, you've got a good standard paper. And I suggest that if you're not a good writer, like me, I'm not a good writer. Uh, I've been told that a few times. But I have been published. I have I've been rejected a lot. I did say that. I didn't say that I do. I have been published. Um, some people have asked, uh, um, you know, what kind of uh, reviews uh, to do. And uh, um, I, I have uh, 14 doctoral students. So uh, they often ask me, what can I do? And human research is, uh, um, is very difficult. So I've advised some of them to do it. I, I don't want it to go overboard all around the world. but. Uh, uh, systematic reviews are getting a good uh, 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 success rate these days where you go in and you take a look at different journals and you come up with a theme and you do a review on that theme and you uh, come out with some conclusions and recommendations from them and so uh, I, I'd recommend that uh, uh, look at those um, uh, it's, it's a good way to start. This, uh, these are some of the good ones that I have on here. But uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll finish off and uh, open it up for more, for more questions. Hi, I'm Di Griffiths from the International University of La Rioja. Um, and I'm going to jump straight back into where we were 
before the slides, I'm sorry. Um, uh, because um, I very much agree with your position on, on publishing and publishers. Um, I'm wondering what actions we need to take, not only as individuals saying, no, we're not going to pay these fees, but as a, as a, as a community and as education systems. What's, what's the agenda for reform for us? And you think I might have an answer. <laughs> I think we need to work. Well, I, I mentioned the, the, the initiative of the librarians in the United States uh, of starting in a small way to say that this amount of money is for open access and it's 4% this year, next year it'll be 8%, next year it'll be 12%. So I, uh, initiatives like that are great. For me, I don't review for, uh, for journals that are not open access. I will not review for them. I'm not giving them the uh, pleasure of my labor. And uh, uh, I won't say that. I, I said, I won't review unless you pay me. Uh, but uh, they won't pay you. They'll take your money, but they won't give you the money back. <laughs> that's for sure. So uh, uh, that's an individual uh, way. And I don't, uh, um, uh, having said I don't publish in, uh, in uh, non diamond journals or none. I, I have from time to time as a co-author worked with people and done that. It's pretty hard to be really strictly principled on it. I wouldn't, uh, uh, I mean, good luck if you can be really principled and not do it at all, but sometimes you work with, I work with younger authors and it's important that they get published in this journal and um, sometimes I don't 100% uh, adhere to it, but I try to do it in general. Yeah, thank you. Maybe I can elaborate a little bit on that because I think that's the main issue. Just a, f a few words about me. I'm the university librarian at the University of Lille in France. I'm sitting on a French board for open access. And I'm also the vice president of the, the Liber League, so the League of Research Library in Europe. So I'm very happy to hear your position on what you said. Um, so elaborating a little bit on your, on your question, I think that um, what probably we should do is, is uh, sustain more bibliodiversity in the landscape. We know that uh, a lot of, of uh, a big part of a system with transformative agreements, with APCs and so on, are based on the gold open access with a central role of publishers just like Springer, Wiley, Elsevier, and, and so on. What we want to foster and to sustain is more bibliodiversity, so meaning sustaining the green model where we put on archive, just like archives, for instance, where the mathematicians put their preprints, you mentioned it, <coughs> and also the diamond model you, you have mentioned. The, uh, and, and you talked a little bit about the report that has been sustained by Coalition S in Europe, uh, made by operas and other partners. So I think this is a good way to, to, to try to, to introduce new models of publication. Uh, we are not alone in that. Uh, Europe has a central position to, in, the, in this lead, but South America also. So I would really be uh, very much in favor of we start between North America, Europe, and South America to build something in common. And maybe what's, that's one of the solutions. Because you know Europe, in terms of publishing, is number one. North America is number two, and South America is quite important. So if we, if we work all together in that direction, then it would change the, the, the model. That's the first thing. And the second thing, which is maybe even more important, is to change the, as, the, the assessment system of a, re, uh, of a research. That's the central issue. Uh, in many disciplines, we have uh, uh, um, promotions for t to tenure positions based on impact factor. That's the reality. So as long as the system is not changed, we will keep having the same problems. So again, that is the moment for that, because uh, we have started an initiative in Europe to try to reform this assessment system, and we hope that again, we will be numerous, not only Europe, but North America, South America, and other people, to change the model, not to rely on, I need to publish in high-level impact factor journals. I need to publish 10, 15 articles a year. What is it about, uh, 15 articles a, a year? You cannot publish good articles with 15 articles a year. So if we change the, the evaluation 
system, then we may be, be able to have a different landscape and a different way of, of publishing and of driving our research community. So I guess that, that is the moment now. So I'm very happy again to, to yes. hear that uh, it's something that he, which is tackled in uh, uh, a conference just like uh, OE Global. Uh, yes, I, I agree that the tenure and promotion uh, system, well, it highly favors those uh, established journals that, uh, and that, that is why, that is exactly why they can charge huge fees um, for their databases uh, to our libraries, is for that exact reason that we must, we must uh, ha have them in the libraries and um, faculty need them in order to get promoted and so we have to change that. Um, I think I just have to uh, mention that the time is well over our slot and we are streaming so it might become a bit awkward. Um, maybe if there are any questions, uh, Professor McGraw would be happy to field them. Yep, sure. Yep. Um, I think that we should just wrap up the session and say what a wonderful contribution this has been to OE Global and give the presenters a round of applause. Thank you so much. And if there are any questions, I mean, it's an open education conference. Please engage, participate, and yeah, collaborate. Thank you. Enjoy the lunch.